Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me today. And thank you for that great introduction. Really excited to talk to you guys, not only as a veterinarian, but a horse owner as well, um, about this really confusing and often overwhelming world of supplements. Specifically, we're going to talk a bit about why supplements are so appealing and how they're marketed to be really appealing to us as horse owners. Um, and then do a bit of a deep dive into some common supplement categories, specifically looking at supplements that are meant to improve digestion in our horses and potentially help um, heal GI inflammation. There is not enough time in a single evening, um, certainly not an hour, to attack all of the different various categories of supplements, but we're going to start with these two kind of big GI categories. And then um, a theme that's going to be pervasive through this talk is how I think through the supplements that are available to us. And there's a, a pretty repeatable scaffold that I use. So I ask myself if the supplement I'm considering has the right stuff in it. So something with some proven efficacy for the problem I'm addressing. Um, is that stuff in the right amount? So a quantity that we know might work to help the horse. Um, and does that supplement actually get to the right place? And this is really important, especially talking about the GI tract, because that's quite complicated in horses. And then, of course, the last question that I have to answer when considering a supplement for myself or my clients is, could this potentially do some harm? And what might that look like? So why are supplements so appealing? Well, they're appealing because we love our horses. Um, most of us, like myself in this picture, have uh, loved our horses since before we can even really remember. Um, but they are really confusing and their problems can be expensive and quite anxiety inducing. And I know this both as a vet and a horse owner. Um, this horse right here is actually my personal horse a few years ago. Um, and one winter in Michigan, she decided weekly, multiple days in a week, to demonstrate this really odd behavior. Um, I got called weekly, almost daily some weeks, that she was doing this and colicky. It would last about five minutes, and then she would stop and go about her day as if nothing happened. Um, and I tried absolutely everything I could think of to diagnose this, address it, and fix it. And it was incredibly anxiety-inducing. Um, if someone had offered me or I had taken anyone up on a supplement that um, I thought would have helped her, I would have tried the whole gamut. Um, so I certainly understand their appeal. And especially as a horse owner, I think it's really important um, to use your veterinary resources like I did with my own horse when I was the client um, to figure out what, what could work and what potentially could harm and what the best choices are. Um, so when our horses have a problem, we're really eager for a solution. There's a, a lot of anxiety when they're, they're having an issue, especially one that's dramatic, um, and potentially a bit nebulous without a clear treatment path. So the appeal of supplements is that they're quite easy and at least at surface value feel relatively inexpensive. You know, it would have been um, much easier to consider putting my horse on a supplement for a problem like this than discussing something like colic surgery if she had um, some sort of lesion that, that, that was causing her discomfort. So when we're trying to address what's out there um, in terms of supplements and, and addressing this appeal of supplements, it is, as I said, really overwhelming and can be really hard to know where to start. Um, and the supplement companies that we typically use know this. So um, I did a supplement generator kind of um, online quiz for my mare. This is her again um, in a much better place than um, she was in the last video that you saw. And I actually left out all of those kind of weird signs that she was showing and just wrote sort of the basic facts about her um, in this supplement generator. She is currently a 19 year old. She's a mare, which is in and of itself, as some of you know, a, a potential problem that could be addressed with a supplement. Um, she does have some insect hypersensitivity in the summer, um, and she has had two actual colic episodes um, in about the seven years that I've had her that have been pretty mild. Um, this particular generator had 400 available products, 
And just based on these four categories of this horse, um, matched me with 11 products for just about $400 a month. And um, that is overwhelming and stressful. Even with my veterinarian hat on as also a horse owner, you feel a bit pressured that um, to, to do the best for your horse, well, why wouldn't you put them on this you know, tendon supplement, geriatric supplement, mare calming supplement. Um, and it, it can be hard to combat that even as someone that, you know, is sort of trained to think about those things critically. So in general, the big disclaimer for this talk is it's important to always ask your vet their recommendations for whatever your horse's problem is, um, whether it's a supplement addressing a problem or just for more maintenance and general health. I always recommend that you talk um, to your veterinarian about the supplements you're interested in and try to be really specific. And um, if possible, give them, you know, maybe a list or a potential list of things you're interested in and some time to, to do due diligence looking at those products um, so that they can give you an informed and educated answer. When you are trying out a new supplement, try to keep some sort of objective log to try to look for that supplement's effect. And this can really help ward against placebo effect where we're just really desperate for something to work because we're worried about our horses and um, may falsely attribute whatever's working to be uh, being that supplement. Also, just a bit um, piece of advice to remember and something I have to remind myself of quite a bit for my own horses and my patients. We do a lot of things to our horses that perturb their natural GI function. And sometimes adding more is really just adding more. It's, it's just adding potential fuel to the fire um, when we're already manipulating a lot, even though it's quite compelling when we're worried to try to do something. So as I said, we're going to do a bit of a deep dive um, into some specific categories. These are supplements that aid in digestion, supplements that promote GI healing. And then for both of these, we're going to talk about how, or at least how I uh, screen a supplement for recommendation. And this is going to be asking if this supplement has the right stuff in the right amount and gets to the right place. I'm also going to highlight the monthly cost of some of these supplements, although keeping them quite generic. So supplements to aid digestion are largely probiotics. Um, and these are really, really awesome in theory. But again, we have to make sure when we're looking at a product, we're assessing it for the right bugs in the right amounts and getting to the right place. Um, as we know, horses digest a ton of uh, roughage in their colons. Their colons have adapted to be these big fermentation vats that can actually function somewhat similarly to a rumen, um, if you guys are familiar with cattle, but it's a different part of the GI tract. So really, really specialized, just like a rumen is, but it's actually their colon. So it's the, the um, back half of their GI tract that's meant to digest a lot of roughage. So horses have a unique digestive system and therefore they need unique bacteria to support that. Most probiotics that are even marketed for horses actually contain the microbes that are most useful for people. And that includes things like lactobacillus, bifidobacterium like in Activia, um, and enterobacterium. And overall, these categories actually make up less than 1% of the colon microbes in a horse. So um, largely, a lot of the products out there are just simply the wrong things. So not the things that our horses need um, to aid in digestion within their colon. What, what is present in the horse colon and may be helpful as a probiotic are bacteria in the Firmicutes um, phylum and then Saccharomyces species, specifically Saccharomyces cerviaceae, which is brewer's yeast. So at a minimum, when I'm looking at a probiotic product, it must have one of these two um, microbes in it to even be considered possibly effective. One real red flag for me that a probiotic is not likely to have the right things um, to potentially aid digestion in a horse is going to be a probiotic that says multi-species because we just talked about how the horse GI tract is really specialized for the horse's unique digestive needs and functions. 
So if a probiotic is meant to address multiple species eating a wide variety of things from omnivores to carnivores to herbivores, then it's probably not going to have the right bugs for each of those species. And this specific product um, really uh, highlights that. So this contains um, the microbes that may be useful for a human, maybe even a cat or dog, but it is marketed for all these different um, species. So this is the first red flag to me. And, you know, although this doesn't seem overly expensive, $25 a month is still several hundred dollars a year, um, which could be put to better use for things for your horse. And this probiotic is about $30 a month, and um, they don't even try to tell you what bacteria are in there. So that's another red flag that I look for when I'm assessing some of these labels. This um, probiotic is $100 a month, which is clearly um, quite a bit of money over the course of a year, um, and has three uh, microbes in them that are not useful to the horse, but does at least have this yeast, Saccharomyces, and it lists that it has seven grams of this um, within each uh, required quantity or recommended quantity for the horse. So is this the right amount? We have at least the, the possibility of the right bug, but are we giving enough in this supplement when fed as directed? Um, probiotics should be labeled when you're assessing for the right amount in a, in a product. They should be labeled as colony forming units. And this basically just means the number of bacteria that should be alive in the product as fed and able to replicate and form colonies in the GI tract. And that's what needs to happen for them to be effective. The actual number that you feed in your supplement um, is only beneficial if they're alive and they can reproduce in uh, the horse's colon and aid digestion that way. So this GI supplement pellet that was about $100 a month lists uh, the Saccharomyces that might be helpful actually only as grams. So we have no idea um, how many colony forming units or potentially living organisms um, of this yeast are actually in there. And when we do know how many colony forming units we're feeding in an experimental setting, um, the resultant uh, bacterial loads in the horse's feces after we feed them are really, really variable. So this means that if we give a known quantity of live bacteria to a wide number of horses, they are going to um, have really variable bacterial concentrations, at least in their feces. So a lot of the importance of these colony forming units is actually very, very horse dependent. So we don't have even great benchmarks to guide um, if we're feeding horses the right amount of probiotic. So let's assume, let's be gracious to these potential supplements and assume that they are the right things and we do happen to know the right amounts could they potentially get to the right place? So probiotics are meant to aid in fiber digestion. Fiber is digested in the horse's large intestine or colon. So a probiotic has to be able to get through the acidic stomach in this whole small intestinal tract in order to get to the colon and really significantly aid digestion. And we have some evidence that um, they probably don't do this. So even if we've met these qualifiers of the right things in the right amounts, they probably don't get to the right place, at least, at least not reliably. And there are a few studies that have shown this. So this is a pretty recent paper that looks at um, looked at 11 commercial equine probiotics, and they essentially took that probiotic right out of the container from the manufacturer and cultured um, its contents, looking for living bacteria that could replicate after putting it through a manufactured horse stomach fluid. So a solution that mimics um, what the horse's stomach would do to uh, this product once it passes through. They also tested for bacterial DNA in these supplements right out of the bag. So not even challenging them with the acidic environment of the stomach. And they found really shockingly that zero of the 11 products met their labeled claim after going through the horse stomach. And even when they only look for DNA, so not living organisms and not testing them by going through the acidic um, 
faux stomach contents, only three of these 11 products had DNA from even one of the microbes that were listed on the label, which is quite concerning. So um, not only do many of these not have the right things, but many of them don't even have the things that they claim to have. Uh, this is a similar slightly older study that looked at 25 probiotics for horses and if they could grow the bacteria that were listed um, on the, the label. And uh, only two out of the 25 actually met or exceeded their labeled claim for what they grew and in what quantities. So the big question is, well, you know, maybe probiotics could help. Um, even if they don't do anything, could they potentially harm? So a lot of people will feed a supplement thinking that there's no harm in doing so, even if it doesn't help. Um, and that could, can be a bit debated um, in the veterinary community. So there are essentially no FDA regulations um, in humans or veterinary species for probiotics, and they're listed as generally regarded as safe. What we do know from these couple studies that have looked at equine-specific products, a lot of these products actually grow bacteria that are not listed. So we don't know if these bacteria could be potentially dangerous. Uh, these bacteria themselves probably are not because realistically they're in such low quantities and probably don't replicate much that they, they're unlikely to themselves cause a problem to the horse by overpopulating. But some of them may carry genes for antibiotic resistance and that may um, allow transference of those genes to the bacteria that are living in the GI tract normally. And we have a little bit of evidence out there that some of these probiotic products can actually harm. Um, so it starts to question that mentality of, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this because I don't think it'll hurt um, with a bit of this data that we have. So this was a study looking at a probiotic given to um, prevent diarrhea and actually shedding of pathogens in foals with diarrhea. This was a probiotic product that contained lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. So we know not necessarily the right things, but um, microbes that are quite common to equine probiotics. And they wanted to know if foals given this product were more likely to have normal manure and shed fewer harmful bacteria compared to foals just given a placebo. They saw that this probiotic had no positive effect, and it actually increased the likelihood of diarrhea that needed um, treatment compared to foals just getting the placebo. So you can see that in these orange bars here. This solid bar is the number or proportion of foals with diarrhea that needed a veterinarian to evaluate them. And this slash bar, uh, this solid bar are the foals that were given a probiotic. This slash bar are the foals that were not. So about twice as many foals given a probiotic got significant enough diarrhea that a veterinarian had to, had to um, intervene and evaluate them. So what does work to aid digestion and keep a really healthy microbial population um, in the horse's colon? This is going to be by far and away consistent and high quality uh, roughage, which is in an ideal scenario, as much grass as the horse has access to and can handle um, based on other comorbidities associated with them. Um, horses that are given um, a high grass content diet actually produce more manure, twice as much manure with twice as much moisture compared to horses on hay diets. So we know that grass is what they're meant to be eating and it's the best thing to support healthy manure production and healthy digestion. Um, horses also do best with frequent small volume meals. They are meant to be grazers. And again, this is grass and access to pasture. Horses on pasture eat more than half of their day, whereas horses that are stalled eat less than a quarter of their day. So that's a pretty big perturbation of what the horse is supposed to be doing, which is going to have significant effects on how they can digest and effects that a probiotic really can't um, help um, overcome. We also want to be sure to minimize grains and sugars, especially if they're not needed for the horse's athletic function. These can ferment quite easily and cause gas and inflammation. Important to note here that 
Um, many complete feeds, even though we call them grains, are actually mostly roughage. So when I say minimizing grains and sugars, I don't mean things like equine senior, because those really are forage based and can be quite helpful for the population of horse that needs them. So everyone really wants to give something, and there are some things that fall into this probiotic category that we can occasionally give to, to help horses that are having digestive issues. The first and probably most um, utilized and potentially most effective in a hospital setting is going to be a fecal transformation. Um, this is poop soup. So we take um, feces from a screened and healthy donor animal, create a slurry of it, and then through a nasogastric tube, we will give it to a horse that's having severe dysbiosis. This is not uniformly performed, and there is some um, contention in the literature with how effective this actually is, but it is probably the best chance that we have for repopulating the GI tract of a really sick horse, but by no means is it itself a, a silver bullet for a horse with diarrhea. We can also give psyllium. Um, we know that psyllium is um, important for is, is an important source of fiber and can help increase microbial diversity and promote GI healing. Um, it is essentially just metamucil, so it's just psyllium husks and pure fiber. Um, most people are most familiar with it in um, applications to help clear sand accumulation, especially here in Michigan and some of our sandy soils. But it is actually um, helpful in just supporting a good microbial population in the horse's um, hind gut. And it's quite inexpensive. So to support this microbial diversity, we have to give about a half a cup a day, and that's less than $5 a month. If we wanted to give an actual microbe to the horse, um, the one that I choose for horses with a dysbiosis is brewer's yeast, which is Saccharomyces. Um, and you can get that at any basic um, nutritional store, or even off of Amazon. Um, this has by far the most potential to help, but there are still a lot of holes in what we know about this, including how much we should feed. When I do recommend it though, um, or when I offer it, I probably, I would never say I, I probably recommend this, but if an owner is interested in feeding a probiotic, um, I, I steer them towards this and, and um, suggest that they feed a tablespoon twice a day. And then just to, to clarify some of these confusing terms when we're talking about probiotics, um, we talk also a bit about prebiotics and postbiotics. A prebiotic is a fiber that the good bacteria of the colon like. So psyllium would be an example of a prebiotic. Probiotic is that good bacteria, or actually it should be microbe because they can be yeasts as well. And then a postbiotic is a dead bacteria or bacterial or microbial product that can still, even though it's dead, exert some sort of positive effect. And we really know nothing about postbiotics in horses. And the absolute best prebiotic for horses, even though you could give psyllium, is fresh green grass and good high quality roughage. So some of our probiotic take home points um, if you're going to put your horse on one, pick a product that at least claims to have the right things in them, which are going to be these Saccharomyces. These products have really poor quality control, so just know that going into um, your supplement use, uh, especially if you're using one that does have um, this more heavily manufactured long list of ingredients, opposed to something like a straight brewer's yeast. You have to understand the limitations of these products because of their poor quality control, and they're not going to replace good management, hygiene, and feed quality, and um, they may have some downsides. So um, in light of that, you have to just decide your personal comfort level with this statement that the FDA makes for human probiotics as well, that they're generally regarded as safe. The next category of supplements we're going to talk about are those that um, propose, promote uh, GI healing or claim that they promote GI healing. And this uh, largely applies to ulcers, which can occur in the horse's stomach. Uh, this is the, the bottom half of a horse stomach here with some circular ulcers it's called the pylorus. 
And we can get stomach ulcers in both the upper portion or the squamous portion, which is uh, closest to the esophagus where the food goes first, or this lower stomach, which is the glandular portion, which is where the food exits into the small intestine. Importantly, another whole different category of ulcers are called hindgut ulcers, and these are ulcers in the colon, and these two things are quite different. When we have ulcers, we have some sort of imbalance between acid production, specifically in the stomach, and lining or mucosal protection. And this um, problem with defenses or lining protection can apply to both the stomach and the hindgut, but an acid production problem really only applies to stomach ulcers because that's where the acid is meant to be. That's where it can do harm. There really isn't um, significant consistent acid in the hindgut or colon to cause an acid production problem ulceration. So the goals of our supplements that are meant to promote GI healing are ones that can reduce acid production, particularly for the stomach, and promote repair of this mucosal lining, both in the stomach and the colon. And again, we have to interrogate these supplements for the right things in the right place and in the right amounts. So some of the things that are thought to help with GI healing are going to be plants with um, something called mucilage. And this is essentially um, the thing that makes okra really disgusting. I don't know if anyone here um, wrote that they're from Louisiana. I'm sorry if you are um, and you enjoy okra, but I've never made it successfully um, to mitigate this mucilage. Some of the things that we give horses or that are common in supplements that are thought to have this mucilage are things like aloe vera, fenugreek, kelp, marshmallow root, and plantain leaf. Sea buckthorn berries are also um, quite, quite often reported to help with GI healing. These are um, essentially just berries with a lot of antioxidants in them. Then things like acid reducers or antacids, which are going to be um, supplements or products that contain magnesium, calcium, and alum aluminum. And then a few other sort of random things. So sometimes you'll hear about a, a pectin-lecithin combination, which is basically just this gelatinous fiber and phospholipid. And then we'll talk about anti-inflammatory omega-3s and oils, which can help with some GI healing as well. Of this whole list of things um, highlighted here are the ones that do have a little bit of evidence behind them and might be able to help. That's aloe vera, sea buckthorn berries, calcium, magnesium, and aluminum, pectin, lecithin, and then omega-3s and oils. And um, I'm going to go a bit out of order here when I talk through them because I'm going to talk through the ones first that probably have the most evidence and are most likely to help. So we're going to start with the oils. Um, there is a bit of evidence that um, oil will help reduce stomach ulcers, certainly in the stomach and maybe even in the hindgut. And it does this by increasing the production of protective mucus and improving blood flow to these organs. So it helps bolster defenses, which is why it can help in both the stomach and the colon. And um, I'm using this change, this term um, hindgut and colon interchangeably because that, that is how we refer to them. Um, for, these, for this purpose, hindgut and colon are interchangeable. Antacids are acid reducers. They're only going to work in the stomach because that's where acid is actually a component of ulceration, not in the hindgut. And they have a really, really short-lived effect, just like when you take a Tums. Pectin and lecithin, um, we do have some evidence that they help to mitigate stomach ulcers, probably by providing some good fiber and a bit of um, gelatinous coating to ulcers. Aloe vera also might help to heal stomach ulcers, but in the couple studies that have looked at it, um, it is consistently inferior to uh, GastroGuard, which is the labeled product for, for treating this disease. And C, buckthorn berries are antioxidants, which um, in one paper helped to prevent the progression of ulcers, which maybe supports their use, but is certainly not kind of a robust claim for them. When we give canola oil to help um, promote GI healing, you want to give about two ounces once or twice a day, um, either as in a syringe or fed. 
antacids, we need, a uh, horse needs about 15 milligrams of calcium or magnesium in order to acid suppress. And again, that's a really short period of time. They need about 200 milligrams of these pectin lecithin, lecithin supplements, nine grams of aloe vera, and 36 grams of sea buckthorn berries. And this is just important because when you're looking at supplements that contain any of these, so things with the right stuff, and um, we do have to make sure they also have the right amount. So looking at a couple of these supplements that are out there to promote um, GI healing, this is one um, that is uh, purported to help with hindgut ulcers. And I just want to point out here before we go into this deep dive, um, horses, they, they say on their label that you have to give this supplement for 90 days to see the full benefits. A lot of problems that horses are having, especially GI problems, are going to be resolved in 90 days regardless of what you're doing. So um, I keep I, I, a little bit of a red flag when I see something like this as well, because you know, in 90 days, uh, this is just really asking for a placebo effect, in my opinion, to say, oh, we need three months to see an effect. And probably whatever problem you had three months ago is actually just gone. So looking more a deep dive into this one, does it have the right things for GI healing? Um, we look at the, the guaranteed analysis for this supplement. Um, and essentially, all we're looking at here is uh, protein, fat, and fiber supplement. These two um, things here, threonine and glutamine, are actually amino acids. Um, only of these two, threonine is an essential amino acid for horses. Glutamine is not. There is a little bit of evidence that glutamine um, helps promote GI health, but again, you have to be really cognizant of quantity here. It only makes up about 1% of this supplement, and you're feeding just a small scoop of this. So um, are you really feeding enough to make any sort of difference in their big GI tract? So at least this individual supplement is really just protein, which is amino acids, um, fat, and fiber. And um, it's going to cost you about $100 a month. And you have to spend at least $300 to treat your horse for three months to see if it even works. Um, and it really doesn't have anything that cannot be found in good quality hay, pasture, or grain. This next supplement we're looking at for the right stuff here. Um, this supplement has calcium and magnesium. So we know that those are potentially antacids if fed in the appropriate quantities. So maybe it has the right stuff. Also does have pectin pulp in it as well as aloe vera. But now we have to ask ourselves, are these things in the right quantities? Um, and this supplement is a bit cheaper, but still $35 a month. Is it the right amount? Next big question here. The whole dose of this supplement that a horse is recommended to get is 60 grams. So when we look at the calcium content, it's three and a half percent of the whole dose, which is 60 grams. So you're only feeding about two grams of calcium at best with this supplement. The daily requirement for a horse is 30 to 40 grams. So this two grams is really quite abysmal. An antacid effect is seen with 15 grams. So again, this is less than 10% of that. And hay fed at 2% of body weight to the average horse. First cutting hay is going to provide about 45 grams um, of calcium to the horse. So this two gram supplement is really not doing anything that consistent access to good quality hay is not doing. And the same principle applies to magnesium. Two grams is provided based on this three and a half percent of the 60 gram dose. Daily requirement for a horse is less than calcium. It's only about 10 grams. So at least we're providing a larger proportion of that. But the antacid effect is still seen, seen with the same dose. So you need 15 grams for that. And hay fed at 2% body weight to the average horse if it's good quality gives about 20 grams of magnesium a day. So you're not getting anything with these minerals that you wouldn't get from good quality hay. When we look at the pectin lecithin, um, we're feeding an unknown amount, so they actually don't quantify, but it's pretty far down on the ingredient list. And the papers that we have show an effect on, on ulcers when we feed 200 grams of pectin lecithin, and this whole dose is only 60 grams, so there's no way that we're feeding enough. 
Aloe, again, we're not told how much is going to be in here. We see a possible effect of aloe vera when it's fed um, in a quantity of nine grams to the horse, and we just don't know how much is here, uh, but it's pretty far down on the ingredient list. This is another um, supplement that is um, probably one of the more worrisome to me, just in terms of category of supplements, because it has so many ingredients listed. Um, that it can be really hard to understand how each of these might be affecting the horse. So when we look at um, a supplement here, this is actually that same one that we talked about as having some Saccharomyces listed. Um, oh, right here, seven grams. And it has a whole cohort of other things that we're feeding to the horse to potentially help with GI healing. So does this supplement have any of the right things, any of the right stuff? Well, it does have calcium, magnesium, pectin, aloe vera, and C. buckthorn, um, all outlined here. But is any of it in the right amount? It's got seven grams of magnesium, which again, we need about double that for any antacid effect, which is gonna be really short-lived even at best and um, really pales in comparison to what good quality hay throughout the day can provide. Magnesium, it's got five grams, same thing, not enough to have an antacid effect and certainly not as much as you can get from good quality hay. Pectin lecithin, unknown quantity, but um, it's gonna be less than 17 grams up here. And we know we need to feed 200, so it's just not enough. Aloe vera, there's that one here. Oh, up here as well in this proprietary blend of things. Um, it's one of many ingredients making up 17,000 milligrams, which is only 17 grams, even though it reads like it's quite a lot. And we need at least nine grams of aloe vera to have any sort of protective effect. Sea buckthorn, same thing. It's in this proprietary blend. So it's going to be less than 17 grams because it's one of several components here. And we need at least 36 grams. So of the things that could help, we really don't have the right amounts with this specific supplement. And then we have a whole lot of other things. And this is what makes me a bit nervous. So what is all of this everything else? So we have some probiotics and we have some sugars, amino acids a very small amount of psyllium, some mucilage products, but some that we have absolutely no idea um, if they actually do anything or get to the right places in the horse's GI tract. Most of them likely get degraded in the stomach. Some fiber, some chlorophyllin. I'm not sure on what that's supposed to be doing, the sodium copper chlorophyllin. Um, silica, which is basically just sand. Kaolin, which is clay. And then this enzyme Q, which is some propri pro proprietary blend um, of mostly aspergillus. So this is where I really start to get worried about some of these supplements, especially the ones that have these really, really long ingredient lists, because um, I worry about unintended consequences. And this is a horse that I had um, here at Michigan State in the hospital during my residency. His disease had nothing to do with supplements, but is one of my favorite um, highlights of this principle of unintended consequences. So this is a sweet horse that came in for colic, um, ultimately needed colic surgery. And we found this in his small colon. So this last part of his GI tract that has the formed fecal balls in it. Um, and we had no idea what this was. It was sort of cloth-like, um, but had basically been cast in mineral as it worked its way through the horse's gut and was eventually causing an obstruction. We showed it to the owner and she said, oh my gosh, two years ago, um, around Christmas, one of the other boarders at the barn hung up um, little treat bags and his went missing. And this was that little treat bag two years ago. So this to me is just the perfect example of an un unintended consequence or this idea that no good deed goes unpunished. You know, you're doing a nice thing, hanging up 
a treat bag for your boarder mate at the barn and their horse decides to eat it and needs colic surgery because of it two years later. And I apply this thinking to supplements too, because I always want to foreshadow or predict um, what unintended consequences my choices might have for both my own horses and my patients. So the big unintended consequence that I worry about with supplements is going to be things like colic. So um, we don't have a lot of information on, on things like uh, recurrent colic and repeated colic, but it is a particularly worrisome problem because it's really challenging and really expensive. And it's one of our causes of colic that commonly um, is treated by owners with supplements. So it's important to understand if those supplements might have any sort of effect on the actual primary problem. So when we have looked at horses with recurrent colic, we've asked ourselves, or these researchers have asked, if there are any consistent features of these horses that have repeat recurrent colic. And in fact, there is. Um, most of the horses evaluated in this study, at least for recurrent colic, had some version of inflammatory gastrointestinal disease or IBD. 55%, so more than half of the horses in this study with recurrent colic, when they took sections of intestine and looked at them under the microscope, did see IBD. And this is really worrisome to me because we don't understand the things that trigger IBD in horses. We really hardly understand those triggers in humans. So things like allergens may very well be a culprit. And when I see a big long list of ingredients that really don't have much proven efficacy, what I see in this list is just a, a whole host of risk factors for uh, potential GI allergens. And I don't know if these are going to be having any sort of effect in the horse's GI tract that may actually cause colic, which is the thing that the horse may be suffering from that, that prompts you to put them on this supplement in the first place. So what things might work to promote GI healing? We all want to give something. We all want to help our horses. Canola oil, um, of the un or some of the more expensive oils like rapeseed, flax, et cetera, that have a lot of omega-3s. Canola oil is my favorite of the inexpensive ones because it has that best omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. Um, and this can actually help to mitigate GI ulceration. And unless you already have a significantly overweight horse, there isn't much downside to this. Calcium and magnesium can certainly help promote GI healing as antacids, but they're really, really short-lived. And there's probably no benefit to an actual calcium magnesium supplement beyond just frequent good quality hay access. Um, if your horse has a real ulcer problem, second cutting or even alfalfa may be um, the best choice to just provide these um, macro minerals. Pectin and lectin. Lecithin might help a horse with um, mucosal healing and GI ulceration, but you just have to make sure you're giving enough, which can be really hard. These things aren't particularly palatable, which is why there isn't more in our supplements. Aloe, same thing. It might be helpful. It is inferior to the actual medical treatment for uh, gastric ulcers. And if you are going to give it, you do just have to be sure to give enough. Sea buckthorn, same thing, it might be helpful or at least um, might prevent progression of ulcers. Um, this is sea buckthorn right here. It's kind of pretty little orange berry, um, but you have to make sure that you're giving enough. So the take home points here for me are consider um, where your horse may have ulcers and talk to your vet about what they're most sus suspicious of. Are we worried about the stomach or the hind gut or both? If we're worried about the stomach, um, acid suppression is, is um, important. Acid suppression is not necessarily important in the hindgut. You want to know what things do have some proven efficacy. This is going to be oil, maybe aloe, maybe pectin less, lecithin, maybe sea buckthorn and calcium and magnesium. Know what amount is needed and make sure the supplement approaches that amount. 
And then my recommendation is to always look for the simplest sources of these things, because I do worry about what allergens we're exposing inadvertently our horses to with some of these supplements. And that can be a real risk for recurrent colic. So I'm just remembering this, this um, effect of unintended consequences. So the question associated with this talk, is there a supplement for that? Maybe. Um, but it's important to remember that a supplement is not necessarily a solution. So think really critically about the ingredients and in the supplements that you're choosing and their sources. Uh, talk with your vet, encourage them to be honest with you with their opinion um, and, and try to take that to heart. Unfortunately, that means that we have fewer easy answers to complicated problems than we want. Um, but uh, in my opinion, it, it's better to kind of accept that reality than maybe give something that could, could pose some harm. These supplements can actually be really expensive. And, you know, of course, they're not the, the upfront cost of a gastroscopy and a month's worth of um, gastric ulcer treatment. But $100 a month for one of these supplements is certainly that quantity over the course of a year. And if the supplement isn't going to help, but the scope and the medical treatment will, then even though it's a more upfront cost, it may overall be a better, better use um, of money and better for the horse. And it won't hurt. Um, it's just a bit of a dangerous logic, especially when we don't know exactly what all these ingredients are and what, what they might do to a horse. And then the other thing that I talk to clients a lot about is um, the colic coverage associated with some of these supplements. So supplement-driven colic coverage, um, if you subscribe to this monthly supplement that, um, at least for the ones I've looked at, range anywhere from $50 to $180 a month based on um, which supplement you choose. Often these colic coverages only apply to colic surgery, and there's a lot of, of um, colics that are actually treated medically. And if you are in one of these supplement-driven um, plans, you're going to pay between $600 and $2,200 a year based on the supplement that you choose for your horse to be able to go to colic surgery. On the flip side, insurance, this is insurance on my own horse here, the same one that I would have paid any money for a supplement to fix a couple of years ago. Um, she's 19 years old. I have mortality and $10,000 of major medical on her. So that'll apply to anything, not just colic and certainly not just colic surgery. And even as a now geriatric 19-year-old, um, this costs me less than $1,000 a year. And of course, that's going to expire at some point based on her age, but a lot of these supplement-driven programs may as well. And with that, I'm happy to um, take any questions. So I will read your first one. When you say hay or good quality hay, what type of hay are you recommending or using as an example for these calcium, et cetera, calculations? Yeah, so I just did um, a first cutting hay for those. So um, that was not any sort of special second cutting or alfalfa. That was just um, what is kind of considered standard for a good quality first cutting. And if you're worried, um, at local extension offices can help um, test for hay quality and test for these macro minerals. So that's the absolute best way to go about it um, and, and more reliable than just kind of eyeballing the hay for quality. Perfect. Will just canola oil help as a preventative for ulcers? If so, how long do you give it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it certainly could because we know that it increases things called prostaglandins, which are really um, protective to the mucosa. So um, the first answer to that question is yes, it could potentially prevent ulcers. And the second question is, or second answer is, as long as your horse is not getting fat off of it. Or rarely, um, I have seen horses develop a little bit of loose manure from it. But as long as your horse is in good body condition, there's really no problem um, with continuing that even indefinitely if you wanted to. Okay. Um, so is it correct to say that there is no place for supplements um, in the horse 
that has had a previous colic surgery. Magalding is 19, had colic surgery at age eight with no bowel resection. He did have a colic episode recently, but associated with an antibiotic issue and was treated medically successfully. Yeah, that's a great question because we obviously really want to prevent something as dramatic as needing colic surgery um, from ever happening again. Um, I will say that when I talk to clients about um, these intestinal accidents, we call them, um, which is something that, and, and I don't know what your horse had, but something that either twists or gets out of place or displaces um, that needs immediate surgery. I am willing to give a horse one of those events in their lifetime as a random occurrence. Um, and I think that fixating on preventing that from happening again could cause some unintended consequences of providing a lot of supplements that um, may have um, inflammatory effects in the GI tract that we just can't predict. So if your horse and if your vet has not suggested that this was um, a potentially recurrent problem, then I don't know that I would be um, reaching for a supplement to prevent it from happening again, because we do often call these things intestinal accidents that bring horses into colic surgery. Um, here's another one. Uh, if you're willing to share, did you ever diagnose your mare, the behavior? No, of your mare? I didn't. I used a lot of my medical insurance for, um, I actually, it was during my residency. I will tell you what fixed her. Um, it was during my residency. I brought her in panicked, like not a vet, just a complete panicked horse owner who really, really loves her mare. Um, and treated for all the kind of minimally invasive treatable things, even considered taking her to colic surgery to to explore and see if she had something going on in her abdomen. Um, and ultimately didn't do that, but just moved her to another facility that um, had more pasture and grass access and group turnout. And she has never done that since. Good to know. Yes. Along um, the lines, as far as canola oil, are you referring to the canola oil that you can purchase at the grocery store? Yes, sure am. So if it's, don't, it's like they call like the pink tax for things that are marketed to women. Um, this is like, you don't need a equine canola. This is canola oil at your grocery store. Don't, don't pay the horse tax for it. Uh, do you, is the dosage two ounces a day for the canola oil? Yep. Two ounces and a day. Do you typically start that giving it slowly and then work up to that daily amount? Um, I do, but you probably don't have to for a full size horse. Two ounces is only like two shot glasses worth or one, um, 60 CC oral dosing syringe. So it's really not that much. Um, if you have a horse with a really sensitive GI tract, you could start with half of that for about a week and then, um, go to the full two ounces. Uh, what is your take on sunflower oil? Sunflower oil is a good one too. You know, it's more expensive and probably no better than canola oil. Um, I like canola because it has a two to one or, or two or four to one um, omega-6 to omega-3. So it does actually have more omega-6s, which aren't the great omegas than it does three. But um, hay has way more omega-3s and grass has way more omega-3s. So if you give canola oil balanced with good quality hay and grass, then overall your omega-3 ratio is better than six. Um, so your canola oil isn't making, isn't flipping that ratio, if that makes sense, whereas things like corn oil can. Um, but of course, an oil that is higher in threes than six is good. Um, I don't know that it's any better, especially for the cost difference. Um, I know you didn't speak to joint supplements, but does this information generally apply the same? For example, it can help, but can have more unintended consequences um, potentially. 
I think they can. So in general, I am pretty skeptical of any of our cohort of supplements, um, particularly because, you know, we have actual medications that can help with joint issues and joint supplements like Adequan and Legend. And, you know, we actually know that they they can improve comfort and mobility for horses um, affected by osteoarthritis without things like, you know, putting a bunch of allergens in the GI tract. So globally, um, I do apply that same concept to joint supplements as well. We're getting to the end here. Haley, do you have any questions on Facebook Live? Um, yes, I do have one. Um, it says, can she cover a supplement that would be safe for EMS and IR horses, gas type colicky when weather changes? Yeah, that is a really hard one um, because you do want to avoid oils. And um, of course, you know, I'm, I'm a proponent of grass, grass, grass in this whole talk, um, but that's a category of horses that just can't handle that because of the risk of laminitis. But um, one thing that may be effective for a horse like that is psyllium um, because that's just purely fiber. I also think psyllium has helped, um, and there's some evidence that it helps horses with like fecal water syndrome. So where they pass normal poop and just a bit of water around it. So in the horse that you describe, if you do wanna give some sort of supplement, um, I would do psyllium or um, and or Saccharomyces or brewer's yeast. And that applies to that same question. What if your horse is overweight? Um, so you, you have to avoid oil and grass and, and second cutting hay in that scenario. But you can make sure you're giving a good first quality, first good quality first cutting hay with low sugars, but um, normal amounts of macro minerals and um, things like the psyllium or brewer's yeast. Uh, I can ask you one more. So do you recommend feeding the natural raspberry leaf supplement for anxious or moody mares? Do you find that it works? Um, I have never tried the raspberry supplement. People um, do use it for that purpose. And I, I have an anxious, moody chestnut mare. Um, and I have not put her on it and don't plan to. I think if you wanted to, I would look for a supplement that is, again, like the simplest version of that. So maybe avoid the like, ultra moody mare combo plus supplement and try like a raspberry leaf extract alone. 